In 1994, German police went on a raid. They were looking for fake banknotes, but they found something far more sinister. Sealed in a canister were several grams of radioactive plutonium, the material needed to build a nuclear bomb. The discovery set off a scientific detective story which was to stretch halfway round the world. These canisters hold plutonium. If the energy locked in them were released all at once, the result would be an explosion. So every canister is individually marked and accounted for. Under highly controlled conditions, nuclear power stations release the energy slowly to make electricity. The energy and radioactivity come from the plutonium nucleus. The nucleus of every atom is made up from protons and neutrons, about the same number of each. The nuclei of most atoms stay like this forever, but radioactive nuclei are unstable. They're like pieces of popcorn waiting to pop. Once in its life, a radioactive nucleus decays and throws out part of itself as radiation. Some atoms throw out a pair of protons and a pair of neutrons together as a particle. This is alpha radiation. In another nucleus, a neutron might suddenly change into a proton, throwing out an electron at the same time. This is beta radiation. Gamma radiation is an electromagnetic wave with very high energy. It's sometimes given off by a nucleus which has just decayed in another way, as the nucleus struggles to make itself stable. Atoms of the same type always decay in the same way, so it's often possible to work out what type of atom is involved by detecting and measuring radiation. The radiation is a telltale clue to the atom which created it. In Britain, radioactive materials are strictly controlled. The National Radiological Protection Board helps companies to use them safely. Because we can't actually detect radiation ourselves, we can't hear it, smell it, uh, or taste it, we need something that will do that job for us. This is a basic radiation monitoring instrument. The clicking you can hear is due to natural background radiation. Radiation hits this probe and causes this box here to click and this meter tells us how many of those clicks are happening every second. Before I go out to visit a company, I need to check that the radiation monitoring instrument that I'm using is actually working correctly. What I do is take a source of known activity, bring the detection head right up to that source, and as you can hear, this one seems to be functioning correctly. Alpha, beta and gamma radiation have different properties. Alpha radiation doesn't travel far in air. A sheet of paper will usually stop the alpha particles completely. Beta radiation is more penetrating. Paper has little effect. But beta particles find it difficult to pass through denser materials like perspex. Gamma radiation is the most penetrating of all. Only very dense materials, like lead, will greatly reduce gamma rays. Plutonium discovered in Germany was found in a garage belonging to a businessman, Adolf Jäckler. When he was arrested, he boasted that he knew where 50 kilograms more plutonium was hidden, but he refused to say where. He also refused to say what the plutonium was for, but the best guess seems to be international terrorism. Information on nuclear weapons is now widely available. 
Getting hold of plutonium is much more difficult. So how did Yakely do it? The German police sent his canister to the country's top secret Transuranium Institute for tests. Short Circuit was refused permission to film inside, but we have been able to reconstruct some of the techniques which were used to track down the source of the plutonium. Low levels of radioactivity come from many everyday objects. The right equipment can identify its source. Most of the time we do actually know the sorts of radioactive materials that we're handling, but uh, from time to time we do end up with items that arrive in the laboratory. Because I don't know the hazards at the moment, I take the precaution of putting gloves on. This is an old compass. And the interesting thing about this compass is that it does contain radioactive material. Instruments like this, which were used about the time of World War I, often had luminizing material painted on the face to allow people to read the dials in darkness. People often have the, the common misconception that radioactive material glows in the dark. That's not true. What's happening in this case is that radioactive material is giving off radiation and striking another material, which is then giving off light. Finding out exactly which radioactive material is in the compass needs more sensitive equipment. This laboratory identifies radioactive elements from the gamma rays they produce. I've put the compass in a lead-lined chamber to cut out all the background radiation. And what the computer's doing is that it's measuring the gamma rays that the compass is giving out and the energy that the gamma rays are carrying. As it detects each gamma ray, the computer sorts it into a pile depending on its energy. After a while, a telltale pattern builds up. This pattern of peaks here is like a fingerprint for each element, and I can tell that the element from the compass is radium. Radium was used in the early part of this century for making things like compasses glow in the dark, but nowadays there are somewhat better methods to use. Tests revealed that the plutonium in Adolf Jäckler's garage came from a nuclear power plant. But where? The evidence points towards the Russian Federation, a group of countries that formed part of the old Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. In the early 1990s, the Union broke up and things came close to chaos. Incidents like the explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear plant had already revealed a poor record for nuclear safety. Now, international borders were left open, giving criminals the chance to sell stolen plutonium to terrorists who wanted to build a bomb. It seems Yekla was a middleman who planned to take his cut from deals along the way. The Yekla incident underlines the need to control and use radioactive materials responsibly, for good rather than evil. Gavin Hales is 19. One day he hopes to row for Britain. I started rowing at school. It's a lot of hard work and it's all year round, so you have some pretty miserable cold wintry evenings, but uh, it's definitely worth it for the summer, being able to get away from life, being out in the river in the evening. It's giving you a chance to clear your head. Two years ago, a sports injury threatened to stop Gavin rowing. His doctor sent him for treatment that included a radioactive injection. I originally hurt my back playing rugby. I've been having a bit of discomfort in my lower back and I've been to see my doctor, my GP. And she sent me to see Press Hughes at Hampstead Hospital. And Gavin, this is an x-ray of your back and this is the front view of your spine. Mm -hmm. Normally the spine is straight in this view, but this picture shows a curve on the front of the spine with an abnormality in, in this bone here. And I think this is the cause of your pain an acute fracture in, in your spine. It was very concerning. It came as quite a shock. Um, nobody wants a bad back when they're 17 years old. 
So what we'd like to do is to see whether this stress fracture is active, in other words, that it's trying to heal, mm -hmm. or whether it's uh, not doing anything. So we'll arrange what's called a bone scan. Because radioactive material is injected directly into a patient, a bone scan can reveal details which would never show up on an ordinary X-ray. Seema Muhammad Targi will make up Gavin's injection. Large doses of radiation can damage body cells, so Seema has to protect herself and make sure the radioactive material stays inside her special laboratory. Because it has to be injected into a patient, of course, it has to be sterile. And Seema is working within a sterile cell within a clean room. You can see the rubber gloves, and they're held in position by the pressure of the air, which forces all of the dirt out of the uh, clean environment. The injection is made from a radioactive chemical element called technetium. It will travel through Gavin's blood to his bones. The technetium comes from a generator stored safely in the clean room. This is the technetium generator that Seam was working with. I'll just take away the top. That's covered with lead shielding to keep the radiation away from the person operating the generator. What we've got inside is a column of molybdenum. This is continuously decaying into technetium. To wash the technetium through the column, we use some sterile sodium chloride, and the sodium chloride is sucked through the column to this sterile vial. The hospital can use these radioactive materials safely because they don't stay strongly radioactive for long. The technetium injection will only produce strong radiation for a few hours, just long enough to do the bone scan. But the molybdenum generator which made it will last for about a week, long enough to make lots of injections. If I'd been holding this amount of molybdenum perhaps six months ago, it would have been extremely dangerous for me. However, in that six months, it's decayed away, and I can safely hold it. On average, different radioactive elements take different times to decay. Looking at an individual atom, it's completely impossible to tell when it's going to pop. It could happen in the next few seconds. It might take a million years. There's absolutely no way of knowing. But when you look at a large number of atoms altogether, it's clear that on average, some radioactive materials decay much faster than others. The average time it takes half the atoms in a large sample to decay is called the half-life. It takes more than 24,000 years for half a sample of plutonium to decay. But the half-life of other elements is measured in minutes or seconds, so their radioactivity disappears much more quickly. For this reason, radioactive elements with long half-lives tend to be more dangerous than those with short half-lives. Gavin's injection is ready for collection. Technetium has a half-life of just six hours, so the clock has already started ticking down to the bone scan. I've just been down to the radio pharmacy to collect these doses and in this little lead box I have a syringe which has been pre-prepared for me with the dose which we need to give to Gavin. It has a protective shield around it in the carrying box and I'm now going to put it into a syringe shield which has a little lead glass window so that the doctor can see that there is actually some fluid in the syringe and this shield protects her against excessive radiation since she's giving injections day after day. Everything's ready. Daphne calls in a doctor to give the injection. Hello, Hello. come in Gavin. Hello Dr. Doctor. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Very well, thank you. Daphne has explained everything to you before, I believe. Yes, she yeah. has. Yeah. Are you allergic to anything? No. Nope. Any history of asthma? No. Nope. Could you roll up the sleeve for me, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, 
I didn't notice anything. It's just like any other injection, you might feel slightly queasy having a needle stuck in you. But it didn't bother me really. After two hours, the injection had worked its way around Gavin's body. It was time for the scan. Gavin, this is the camera that we're going to be doing the pictures on. Yep. I need you to lie down on the bed, feet that end, head up there, on your back. This is the camera that's going to be taking the pictures. We've got one at the top and we've got one at the bottom. And they're going to be moving around you, taking pictures at different angles all around your body so that we can do a reconstruction in three dimensions. Okay. Some of these scans were a little bit claustrophobic, um, particularly the one where they took uh, a scan of my whole body. It's quite difficult to lie completely still with my arms above my head, and that was, that was the main problem, um, making sure my arms didn't fall asleep. It took about three quarters of an hour in the end. The cameras are attached to a computer. It slowly builds up a picture as each gamma ray is detected. What we've got here are um, some images um, of Gavin's skeleton. The skeleton has absorbed the injection that we've given him, but the area we're interested in is this area just to the left-hand side where there's an extra absorption. This was the clue Gavin's consultant needed. What this um, bone scan is showing is that the bone is active and is doing its attempt to heal. Right. What exactly does this fracture mean in terms of my sport and whether or not I can train? Um... Well, I think <clears throat> what we should do is we'll put a brace on to let this fracture heal, like any other fracture. Right. But I think the idea would be that if we can relieve the pain and get the fracture to unite, we might get away without doing any form of surgery, which would be ideal. Gavin wore the brace for six weeks. The treatment worked, and he was soon back rowing again. In the end, it all turned out rather well. I'm now at New College, Oxford. Obviously, the big opportunity with Oxford rowing is the boat race, uh, which I'd quite like to have a go at. I'm not sure how things are going to go. So I'm going to see. From medicine to nuclear power, radioactivity can be a powerful tool for good if it's used with respect and responsibility.